thank you all for coming. Um, this session is going to be uh, on streamlining VM creation within Kubo. Uh, where are we now? Um, this is actually a follow up to a talk uh, two colleagues gave last year on a similar, well, the same topic in a similar way. Um, I was actually not present because my second child was born, so this is my first opportunity to talk about it. Uh, my name is Lee, Lee Yarwood. Um, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, um, part of the OpenShift virtualization team, the Insta team within that. Um, there's my email address if more people come in, um, GitHub, blog, uh, also where I post a lot about what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so if we go forward, the agenda for today, um, don't, be worry, don't worry, these are relatively small sections, there's just a lot of them. Um, I'm going to touch on what Qvert actually is very briefly at a high level. Um, just for the sake of the talk, I'm mostly going to be talking about the um, API or the CRDs that we provide, the kind of uh, UX that we provide as well for VM creation initially. Um, why, touch on why we're doing this and why we want to streamline VM creation. Um, so that's the goals that we had initially when we started this work, um, how we've initially gone about um, solving the problem, um, what's new um, since the previous talk that my colleagues gave, um, in the, the previous two, three releases of Kiva that we've had since then, um, and what, what's coming next. Hope you have some time at the end for questions. Um, if you could hold questions to the end, that would be appreciated as well. We've only got 30 minutes to get through everything. Uh, before I do start my talk, um, so this is one of three Qvert specific talks that we have at DevConf this year. Um, uh, my colleagues Victor and Ismail will both have talks tomorrow uh, in this room at 2 and 4 o'clock respectively. Uh, we also have the booth uh, that quite a few people have visited already. Um, there's an extra bullet point on here that I should have put on that the community folks are reminding me of. Uh, next week we have Qvert Summit that is an online um, conference for Qvert uh, over two days. Um, you have to sign up to it uh, to get access, but I think most of the material will be on, online afterwards, uh, where we just talk about the current state of Qvert, what's coming next, um, why the Qvert as well. Oops. Didn't even know you could do that. Okay, so uh, Qvert, what is Qvert? Um, again, I'm going to keep it very high level here for the context of the talk. Um, the line that's on uh, the website um, and in various places is a virtualization API for Kubernetes. It's an extension for Kubernetes uh, that allows uh, folks to run uh, virtualized workloads alongside containerized workloads. Um, it's built on uh, the KVM Kubernetes libvirt virtualization stack. Um, I've highlighted libvirt in blue, but should, shouldn't be blue. But um, I've highlighted libvirt because uh, some of the um, uh, trouble that we have, not trouble, some of the complexities that we have in our API kind of come from um, inheriting um, some of the domain XML kind of complexities from libvirt. Um, not, it's not libvirt's problem, we kind of uh, copy and paste it in places and cause our own trouble. At a very high level, to how to look at Qvert, uh, this is the, the high level diagram that's on the website. Um, we um, have agents across all of the worker nodes, we have um, our own controllers, we provide our own aggregated API, um, and as I said before, the ultimate goal, or one of the ultimate goals with it is to allow users to run uh, virtualized workloads, be that legacy, be that something they're transitioning, or just workloads that need to be virtualized alongside um, traditional Kubernetes workloads that are, are containerized. Um, so, in, in terms of how um, Kubert implements this, again, at the API level, we use custom resource definitions to extend the Kubernetes API. Um, this just allows us to define our own kind of top level, high level types. Um, the, the, the first and most important of these is the virtual machine CRD. This is our user facing um, CRD. Um, allows the user to, provide, uh, to define a virtual machine that persists. Um, the actual virtual machine running, that will become clear in a second when we move on to the second CRD. Um, it's our initial touch point uh, with users and uh, it's the most, most featureful CRD that we provide. Um, you can do various operations through it, more advanced operations um, around live migration, etc. Um, it's all orchestrated, hot plug as well, through the virtual machine as CRD and objects that you create. There is a second. Um, and this is the um, virtual machine instance CRD. This is a runtime um, instantiation of the virtual machine. So a running, a running guest 
uh, uh, will be mapped to a, a virtual machine instance. And a virtual machine itself will only have a one-to-one -one mapping with a virtual machine instance. We do provide other types and um, virtual machine calls and things where that isn't the case. It's not one-to-one. -one, but in, in the case of this talk, um, virtual machine to virtual machine instance is one-to-one. -one. And so, yeah, user interacts. In a perfect world, user interacts with a virtual machine. Virtual machine, when it's created and started, uh, then creates a virtual machine instance. And that encompasses the running guest. Um, you can create virtual machine instances directly, but what I'm about to go and talk through, it's all through the virtual machine. Uh, again, very high level information to you, but the website has a whole load more um, information in detail. Uh, there's a plethora of ways to actually try out Qvert if you're interested. Um, that are all on there. there are various um, video introductions, deep dives into the architecture, uh, et cetera. Uh, so definitely go and check it out. So why? Why do we need to simplify virtual machine creation in Qvert? Um, this is a silly way of trying to kind of show um, some of the complexities a kind of casual Qvert user might, uh, might encounter the first time that they try and actually create a virtual machine using Doomguy to express um, sorrow, sadness, anger. Uh, you'll, you'll discover as we go through. Um, so this user has a legacy workload that they would that they want to deploy within a Fedora virtual machine within Qvert. Um, within Kubernetes, like most novice users will probably fire up um, their favorite editor. I'm not going to go into editor wars here um, and work on a, a YAML file to kind of contain their definition. Um, starts with some basics, everything looks fine so far, you know, the API version kind, etc. Down to the spec. Um, they soon discover some of the complexities of the virtual machine, virtual machine CRD and the API that we provide. Um, we actually nest the spec of a virtual machine instance within the, the spec of the virtual machine. Um, so you're already going quite deep before you kind of define anything meaningful. Um, the user then can assign some resources. Um, and they're obviously doing this blind. Now, this is a silly example. No one would ever really give it four megs, but the original Doom required four megs. So why not? Let's do that. Um, trying to submit this, um, it's, it's not successful. It's rejected. And it's rejected because you've not provided a list of devices. I didn't realize a list of devices was even required. Um, you can see that I've got as far as spec template spec domain. Um, but OK, I'll provide an empty list of devices, so just a, a blank uh, structure. Um, OK, cool. What next? OK, I haven't provided running. I haven't provided the run strategy or any kind of definition there. OK, that's really annoying. OK, now I'm starting to get a little bit more angry. OK, look at the documentation. OK, I'll just pick always. Always means that uh, it's a run strategy that will just launch the VMI straight away after the VM's been submitted. OK, the VM's created. Great. Uh, everything must be fine, right? Well, no, it never starts, because I've given it four megs of RAM. So um, there are some corner, there are some edges to the API. There's some pitfalls. Um, there's obviously lots of work that we can do to improve the API. But really, we should be guiding users in a better way, instead of just asking them to continuously write definitions. Um, <laughs> this is a bit stupid. You probably can't read this at all, and it's intentional. Uh, user's colleague attempts to help by providing a Windows example, and you can kind of get the idea that there's a lot in the Windows example. Lots of it is feature settings, um, things about clocks, uh, etc., that are required to get a working Windows instance within Qbert. This is all a bit nonsensical. Okay, so just touching on the highlights of the why then. Um, the virtual machine of CRD is rich, but ultimately very overwhelming. Um, our users shouldn't have to handcraft simple definitions. Um, obviously, we, we don't want to break super users, but um, you know, initial users trying to stand stuff up, trying to experiment. Um, we shouldn't get in their way. Um, users shouldn't need to know all of the best practices as well for a given workload. So you know, the fact that the devices list is required, even if you're not putting any disks into the VM to begin with. Um, we also populate disk actually. I should have said, if you provide a volume, will provide you a disk with it if one hasn't been provided. And um, yeah, we shouldn't we should just make it as easy as possible just to get a running workload within Qvert. So the goals initially with the pro uh, with this work were to just reduce the VM creation 
decision matrix really, um, distill it down to as few things as we could, um, ideally down to a single choice of workload, um, and always focus on providing a valid, runnable VM um, based on the workload. So how have we gone about this? Um, we provided CRDs to encapsulate resource sizing and separately to encapsulate the workload preferences. Uh, I'll go into the detail for that in a second, but um, we've also provided consistent examples of these across Kiva deployments. This is something that's changed recently and we'll talk about more in a second, but um, provided um, the basic examples at the moment for workload that are predominantly based around the OS, but going forward we'll provide actual workload application kind of examples as well, um, and also resource sizing. Um, and also wrap manifest creation and best practices um, in an easy to use CLI. Um, again, we don't want people, uh, casual users having to fire up a text editor just to define a VM. Um, if possible, we'd like to guide them initially, um, if not all the way through the process. Uh, allow workloads owners to set requirements and same defaults as well. So just allowing um, owners of a particular workload, the, the chance to say, like, to get this working, you need at least these, these resources, or um, you need um, to use this set of preferences. Okay, that hasn't rendered properly, but uh, this is the user guide uh, for Kiva. There's a lot of detail in here. It's recently been re um, reorganized, so um, instance types and preferences that I'm about to talk about uh, actually under the, the workload section now. Um, please refer back to this because uh, I'm going to kind of go through it quite quite speed for the next um, a few slides. But this has the whole history uh, and a load more detail on, on what we've done. So the CRDs that we've introduced, there's two types, as I said, the resource sizing and the, um, the workload preferences. On the resource sizing side, we have instance type and we have a namespace and a cluster-wide variant of uh, instance type. They share um, a, a spec. Uh, and they encapsulate the resource-related attributes of the virtual machine instance spec, the thing that's embedded in the virtual machine. Um, by default, you, you're required to provide uh, CPU and memory. Um, so th these are um, down here. That's really small. Um, this is the amount of vCPU, uh, number of vCPU, sorry, um, and the amount of memory. Um, it's a one-to-one -one mapping between the VM. Um, and an instance type, so you can only have one instance type per VM. And um, any user choices within the virtual machine will conflict with the instance type. So if the VM already says that, if the VM definition already requests uh, a vCPU or two, and you also try and use an instance type, it will reject the request. Uh, the second set of CIDs we have are preferences. Um, again, namespace and cluster-wide. Um, it's pretty much all the remaining attributes of the virtual machine instance spec. Um, the difference being that these are preferred values. Um, they do not override or conflict with the user's choices within the virtual machine. The example that I always trot out is around disk buses. So if you have a virtual machine that defines um, a set of disks already within it, and you're using SATA, say, uh, then um, using a preference like this example preference that is using Vert.io for Fedora, um, we won't overwrite your choice of SATA. But any, for any disks that don't define a bus, we'll then define SATA. Um, so it's best practices really um, being, being enforced in the VM. Um, they can also provide resource requirements for a given workload. Um, at the moment, it's just an amount of vCPU and memory. Um, we, we do want to kind of extend that to be potentially GPUs and things like that in the future, but at the moment, it's just CPU and memory. Um, and again, it's a one-to-one -one mapping for the virtual machine. So you can only have a single preference assigned to a virtual machine at a time. Uh, we match through uh, instance type and preference matches that are top level attributes of the virtual machine spec. So nice and accessible, hopefully, even if you are uh, doing this by hand. Um, you provide a name, the kind is optional. We default to cluster-wide because uh, we assume that there are cluster-wide examples in, in, in the environment. Uh, revision name is an internal detail you don't really need to worry about. I might touch on it at the end. Infer from volume has its own slide in the second and is just a, a way that we use to look up and populate um, the name field um, from the volume. So just at a high level, quickly, um, just to reinforce everything, um, left-hand side, you have a single instance type and preference that can be associated with 
the virtual machine. Um, this could be the cluster variant. I've just listed the, um, the namespace variant because the name's shorter. Associate <laughs> um, that with the VM. The, um, they then are taken and used to populate the virtual machine instance spec uh, when we actually create the virtual machine instance at runtime of the VM. Uh, so touching on infer from volume again, um, so real simple uh, feature. Um, given a volume name, uh, we look at the volume and uh, we just look for a set of labels um, just uh, to provide defaults uh, for the instance type and preference. Um, the underlying volumes can be PVCs, data sources, or data volumes. I'll say at the end um, that we're looking to extend this as well to container disks. Um, that's another form of volume that we have, uh, but that's not in place at the moment. Um, we also provide a, a set of um, examples, basically, um, of instance types and preferences now through the common instance types project that's just at V1. Um, it's a customized based project. Um, at the current count, it's 39 instance types and 32 preferences, both namespace and cluster wide. Um, we also have a virtctl create VM uh, to kind of help guide a user through uh, manifest creation. Um, this is just manifest creation. It doesn't actually create the object in the cluster. It will just spit out the YAML back at you. Um, the simple reason being that we don't have switches for every part of the, uh, the CRD at the moment, the API. Uh, we are adding more and more, but uh, for now, um, we have a workable set, but it's likely that more advanced users will need to add it to the definition before they submit. Um, provides instance type and preferences switches um, in first which is um, handles various in volume types and import as well um, so you can just uh, point to a container disk for example um, or some other kind of um, method of importing um, some store uh, an image into your cluster um, and it will handle that um, also allows cloud init user data and network data to be provided the, the UX for it isn't great at the moment it has to be encoded um, but it's a, it's a starting point, and we are adding more and more things each release to that. Okay, so coming back to our hero, who's now looking a little bit happier because he can use virtctl. Um, if we kind of rerun the same scenario where a user potentially under-resources the initial VM that they're trying to create, um, because we are now using an instance type and a preference, um, the, preference the Fedora preference had um, resource requirements embedded within it, um, of one vCPU and two gigs, um, and the nano instance type only provides 512 megs, so we don't get a running VM, but we get an error back, and we get something more useful and understandable, and hopefully the CLI is a bit easier to craft than the YAML definition. Um, the second, um, I don't know why I'm pointing out the screen, <laughs> the second that CTL command assumes that the user has enough awareness to then pick a bigger instance type. Um, so they pick the U1 medium instance type that does provide enough memory. Um, and at that point, the VM's created successfully, and now it is actually running um, and accessible. But things can get a little bit better with inference. So um, with two simple labels on the PVC in this example, um, we can switch over to using infer instance type and infer preference. Um, that gets us exactly the same VM running, but without having to specify uh, the instance type or preference directly. So what's new in Qvert v1.1 to 1.3? Um, the big thing in the context of this talk, there's been lots of things with instance types and preferences, but in, in terms of streamlining VM creation for a casual user, it's the uh, move to infer by default now with virtctl, um, and we've been able to do this because of uh, the introduction of an attribute that I really want to rename because it's ugly, um, and we're still in V1, V2, 1 for the API, but um, infer from volume failure policy. Um, so this allows us to um, ignore errors to infer, uh, so we can basically always have it on. Um, the behavior with inference by default um, is normally to reject the request if we can't find any labels on the volume that you're pointing to, because we assume that there's been some kind of mistake. Um, yeah, with the ignore, uh, with the ignore, um, configurable or option, uh, we can now just leave this on in the output from virtctl. So our user is now very, very happy because that is the command line that they get to use and they get a running VM every time um, out of it. Now, 
the volume import line um, is definitely something else that we'd like to improve because it's there's quite a lot of um, information encoded in the second part in the argument. Um, but for now, it's hopefully with the help text that we have, it's, it's hopefully um, enough to get a user to a running VM. Cool. Common instance types uh, is now also deployed by Vert operator. Um, this is a relatively big change for us. Um, prior to this, um, it was manual deployment only upstream, and then downstream we had a second operator that would do all the deployment. Um, upstream, it is now um, deployed behind a feature gate uh, that you have to enable. Um, the feature gate is in beta, hopefully. <laughs> it's in beta now, um, and will be GA, um, hopefully in 1.4. Um, it's deploying the same set of, of instance types and preferences, um, but yeah, everything's just vert operator, vert operator deployed. So hopefully, commonality across deployments uh, going forward for Qvert. That's a real um, key thing for us. Uh, another big thing is uh, container disks now providing defaults. Um, at the moment, this is through CDI. So uh, two things to explain there: container disks are um, a Qvert-ism, um, I guess, um, a way of us packaging VM images up into um, container images. Um, the container disk project is a sub-project within Qvert where we provide a whole set of examples of these, Fedora, CentOS, Ubuntu, et cetera. Um, and what we've done in that project is to just add some environment variables that define the defaults um, there. Um, the, I'll go on to the end goal in a second, but um, prior to this, we had to, anytime we were using container disks, we would have to kind of set the, the metadata in other projects. So for us downstream, this is great. Um, upstream, eventually, it will be um, useful as well, hopefully, for folks. Um, at the moment, as I said, it's only, uh, this only really works through CDI. CDI is another sort of project within uh, Qvert, uh, the Containerized Data Importer um, project. Um, uh, it provides just a, a set of um, useful CRDs uh, for storage management and uh, pulling in images, importing images into your environment, etc. One of them is the data volume that I'm using here to pull in the Fedora contain container disk. Um, once the Fedora container disk is being pulled in through the data volume, it actually populates the data into a PVC. Um, and through CDI, we then end up with the, the labels being populated uh, to use by infer from volume. Um, yeah, so that, at the moment, you have to go through CDI to get these labels populated. Um, I'll touch on it in another slide as well, but the, um, the ultimate goal of this is uh, for users just to point to a container disk and get the same experience and get the, the defaults um, directly through just requesting the use of the container disk through the VM instead of going through CDI. Okay, what's next in v1.4? Um, moving the API to v1. Um, I did put a total on that, didn't I? Yeah, 1.4-ish is the first thing. The real big thing, um, this is a back-end implementation thing, but the, the big thing stopping the whole thing, the whole API group moving forward to v1 um, is our mutation of the virtual machine spec. Um, this is not a good thing to do in Kubernetes because um, it breaks um, it breaks various users who well declarative anyone doing declarative management essentially where you you provide a virtual machine you don't expect it to change and suddenly you, something comes back that's different um, so yeah there's three areas where we are mutating the spec at the moment so we need to drill down on that before we can move to v1. Um, Allowing inference directly from container disk is another big one. Obviously, with Vert CTR, that would improve the whole flow no end. Um, and architecture requirements in preferences as well. Um, the set of preferences that we provide at the moment assume that um, the workload is x86. Um, obviously, that isn't always the case. So we need to be able to express that the architecture could be something else like ARM. Um, so we can also provide usable preferences there as well. Uh, common instance types deployment by default, I've touched on that, um, graduating to GA, hopefully until then it's behind the feature gates. Um, Vert CTL stuff, um, we're looking to add network and interface support, SSH, SSH key support as well, injection support, just making that whole UX a bit better. Um, contributions are welcome because there's so many, so many bits to the a API, but um, that's 
all I have today. Is there any questions? Yep. Okay, yeah, you first. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I might not be the best person for that, but let's go. It's uh, it's lots of clicking. Uh, only two seconds. <laughs> Probably be quick if I do this. Do this yeah, version. Yeah, yeah. So in the top one, you've got the VM with containers. Yep. Um, so what you're saying there is that the, the VM can um, work. Is this on a node basis or within a pod, or how does it work that you can then access or um, have uh, networking when containers can speak to the VM and the VM to the containers? Is that is that a correct assumption or not? Yeah, no, they can. Um, the specific details of which I'm not a networking guy, so I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, I believe it's a cross host they can, they can talk, uh, but it's within the same. I'm going to get the term wrong here. Come by the booth and I'll refer you to a networking yeah. guy. Just so I don't say the wrong thing and get yeah. it recorded. Yes, yeah, 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 of course, yeah. 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 Yep, sorry, so I should be repeating questions, sorry, yeah. Um, so th the question was um, updating the instance type and changing the instance type of the virtual machine. And if, be prop if the changes will be propagated to the virtual machine. So yes, you can. Um, prior to um, the current release to 1.3, um, it would require a restart of the virtual machine for those changes to propagate. Um, but with 1.3, we have introduced what we call live update support for instance types, um, basically hot plugs uh, for vCPUs and memory. Um, it's building on work that's already in Qvert for hot plug. Um, and behind the scenes, that's using live migration to grow the virtual machine. We can't do it in place because of constraints for Kubernetes. But um, the big caveat with it is that um, when you increase the number of vCPUs, um, you can only increase the number of sockets that are exposed to the guest. Um, so you, you can't expose the number of cores or threads or anything like that, so it has to be sockets. But yeah, if you go from um, one instance type to another and there's more sockets, well, there's more vCPUs, but you're, you're exposing them as sockets, um, yeah, we'll, we'll grow the VM for you um, live, and memory as well will grow. Is that all good? Awesome. Yeah, so the question there is, does it support Windows guests and does it support different versions of Fedora and Windows? So you said it's a set of preference Fedora, but what about say Fedora 40 and Fedora 42? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, yes, it does support Windows. Um, yes, it does support multiple versions of Fedora. Where is the example of it? Uh, this is the preference. Yeah, so. Ultimately, at the moment, the reason that this isn't um, version specific is because we haven't found a need. Um, the the, uh, the preference works across all of the supported versions of Fedora at the moment, and because Fedora moves quick so quickly, there's no trailing support, thankfully. If that were to change, then we would introduce a, a version specific uh, preference. We have version specific preferences for CentOS and RHEL and things like that, because uh, Things have changed over time, and especially for Windows, like with VTPM being required and stuff. Um, yeah, there's there's version specifics there, but um, it doesn't. In in OpenStack, there's the um, uh, the common kind of issue of flavor explosion. It doesn't necessarily stop you needing preferences for you know every single kind of um, connotation of uh, of your workload, but it, it can help generalize things so you don't end up with. Um, you know, a huge number. Um, but yeah, where, where there are changes, you will need a different preference, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so the question was, does the uh, but I guess in general support live migration and yeah, yes we do. Yeah, live migration is fully really supported and, and working. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, there's no, yeah, the, the virtual machine would remain running. All of the normal uh, live migration caveats apply. Um, so if it's a busy workload, it will take longer to live migrate and stuff, but the, it will remain running or, um, during that, or it have the appearance of remaining running. It doesn't actually, but there's a small, a small kind of stop. But yeah, it's fully supported anyway. Let's do that. Any other questions? Cool. Um, if that's everything, I'll just remind everyone again the booth and the two talks. Thank you for your time. And uh, yeah, cheers. Thank you.